Good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, from wherever you are in the world. On behalf of WHO, Unitaid and the Medicines Patent Pool, I would like to warmly welcome you to the first of what are three hepatitis events going on during the lunch break at the World Health Assembly. This is the first, the next two are tomorrow and Friday. This one is entitled 10 years left to eliminate viral hepatitis. What now, what next for uptake in hepatitis C treatment in low and middle income countries? My name is Charles Gore and I am the executive director of the Medicines Patent Pool and I will be moderating this session. So as you may have seen last week, WHO published their report on HIV viral hepatitis and sexually transmitted infections. And in hepatitis C, it's very encouraging to see a significant success. Uh, we're now talking about 58 million people living with hepatitis C as opposed to 71 million uh, five years ago. However, there's still a lot of challenges and alarmingly only 21% of people with hepatitis C are currently diagnosed. And that of course means that far too few are accessing treatment. And if we're going to reach the 2030 targets of viral hepatitis elimination, it's very clear from the WHO report, we need a six-fold increase in access. And this applies particularly in low and middle income countries. So today I have great pleasure in being joined by some extremely important voices who will share both successes and challenges in the fight against hepatitis C. And um, I just want to point out that as this is happening during the World Health Assembly, we only have one hour and we're going to try and cover a lot of ground. And so what I'd ask you to do for your questions is to put them into the chat in Zoom and the panelists have agreed to attempt to answer those uh, throughout the session. So I'd like to begin by handing over to Dr. Meg Doherty, the director of the Global HIV Hepatitis and STI programs at WHO, who will present the latest findings around hepatitis C from the strategic report that I spoke about earlier. Meg, over to you. Great, and I just want to check to make sure you see full screen or do you see partial screen? We see full screen, thank you. Okay, so very good. Well, I have seven minutes and I'm going to keep to time to give you a very quick presentation of the progress report that we um, launched just last week on the 20th of May, and also that it is outlining um, our progress on our global health sector strategies. But I will focus in on the hepatitis C elements. And tomorrow, this will be discussed at the World Health Assembly under a decision point to renew and update these global health sector strategies. So if, you, if you're familiar with our global health sector strategies, they were built around five strategic directions, built in, and um, had three elements, one for HIV, one for hepatitis, and one for sexually transmitted diseases, where we were essentially able to bring some of the synergies and interactions across the three diseases together into the strategies. And when we're starting to report out in this new, um, now at 2020 and 2019 data, we see, especially across the three diseases, that we have 2.3 million deaths per year caused by these three diseases. And here, 1.1 million from hepatitis B and C together. Among those, 500,000 cases of hepatocellular carcinoma caused by hep B and hep C. So clearly there's a burden but some of the burden is reducing in terms of the hepatitis C deaths as we move forward. But we also know we have much more work to do. One of the slides that you'll find in pieces of data is really this one slide that's sort of a key important piece of information, which gives you the, both the number of new cases and deaths of both hepatitis B and C across the world. And globally, we have now 3 million new hepatitis C and B infections per year, 1.1 hepatitis B and C deaths, with significant declines in hepatitis C, and we attribute that to the scale up of the DAAs or the direct acting antivirals for hepatitis C. But we have more work to do in terms of the cascade. 21% of those 
with hepatitis C have been diagnosed and only 62% of those on treatment. Yet, even with that small coverage, we have a ninefold increase in the number of people receiving curative treatment for hepatitis C now noted at 9.4 million. And of course, we're doing fairly well in hepatitis B, but the focus today is hepatitis C. Here you'll see the, uh, what we are calling our cascade globally, uh, where we still have to do quite a bit of scale up to get 80% of those who don't know their hepatitis C status tested. And we have some countries and regions that are really paving the way and others that need to do more. So in, in many regards, we have to focus on the gaps and we have to have a differentiated approach to how we're dealing with hepatitis C as we move forward. The burden is also quite important. Even if we stop new infections today and reduce deaths from treatment, we also have to consider for hepatitis C the number of people out there who need to be identified and where do we, how can we identify those? And as you can see, across all of the regions of WHO, there's quite a bit of work to be done to scale up the testing and linking to treatment. Now, when we take a look at these results and related to our previous targets that were outlined in our health sector strategies from 2016 to 2021, we had what we were calling relative targets, reducing new infections by 90% by 2030, reducing deaths by 65%. And you can see we started slow in, and had sort of reasonable targets for 2020, but now we need to pick up the pace. And what you'll see as we start to plot this against where we need to go, we have to pick up the pace and we have to capture and really drive home our innovations that we know that are life-saving to reach those 2030 targets. We also have to look at this in the context of COVID, where we've seen that both hepatitis B and C diagnosis and treatment were more than 50% affected during um, the COVID epidemic. And so we have to keep an eye on this, that we are opening up these services and making sure that they're considered essential health services. Lastly, I want to just show that we are also looking across the five strategic directions of our strategies. And this pie chart now shows us that actually on accountability, we're doing much better and we're in the yellow. Next time we report out in five years, we'd like to be able to show that we're in the green. Particular importance will be around ensuring there's equity as well as good financing for, these, for, this, for hepatitis C as we move forward. We have a shared vision for the next strategy, and we hope as of tomorrow, the World Health Assembly will endorse a decision point to develop new strategies to take us to 2030 and fill that gap, where we have a vision of viral hepatitis transmission stopped and everyone living with hepatitis have access to safe and affordable care and treatment, as well as eliminating viral hepatitis as a public health threat by 2030. One area this week will be sharing new criteria on which a country can validate hepatitis elimination. And with that, we'll be working with countries on assessments. So what are the next steps for WHO on the road to 2030? We're going to review and update the critical elements for the new strategies. And so we welcome all of your inputs. We will possibly develop new absolute targets to help us look at the midterms. We're conducting country pilots and assessments for the validation criteria, and we're expanding capacity in countries with all of your support and building back post, uh, post uh, COVID. We really have not just 10 years, it, looks, it feels like now we only have nine years to reach our SDG targets. So we need all stakeholders to accelerate and to reach these ambitious targets. And as our World Hepatitis Day theme is, Hepatitis can't wait. So we're looking forward to hearing from all of you and working together to solve this actually feasible to solve problem. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Meg, for presenting uh, this really excellent report with its uh, great new data. Um, we'll now share with you uh, a message from Unitaid's Executive Director, um, Philippe Dunaton. Dear colleagues, Dear partners, dear friends, 
I'm very pleased to participate to this event co-hosted by WHO, United and MPP against HCV. We strongly believe that elimination of HCV is possible, but we have only 10 years. So it's a little time and we need to be very proactive. United is proud to have contributed to simplification, transformation and acceleration of the response against HCV. Simplification of testing, decrease of price, demonstrate that program against HCV was possible in LMICs. And the key element is access. I think MPP in particular has been very proactive in that fight and demonstrate again how important access is for the response. We believe strongly that more is to come, more needs to come, in particular the funding, to respond to the challenge that we will face, in particular, in particular with the pandemia. Of course, that the pandemia will have an impact in terms of access to care, access to the funding, and also the priorities. So this is a point that we will have to discuss together, but the first step first and access is now a reality. Thank you for your attention. And I would now like to introduce Dr. Sabin Sansimana, who is the Director General of the Rwanda Biomedical Center uh, to talk about the, the successes that Rwanda has had in addressing hepatitis C. Dr. Sansimana, the floor is yours. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a, a pleasure for me to join this um, uh, important uh, conversation on hepatitis uh, elimination. This is something that um, we've been part of since uh, uh, beginning of 2020, uh, 2012, uh, when we started thinking about hepatitis elimination. Uh, I've prepared a few slides that uh, I'll run through in the next few few minutes. Uh, as Dr. Meg presented, I think uh, we, we've made progress and we're yet to uh, achieve more, uh, continue working together. Uh, if you look at where we came from and where we are today, um, I want to just highlight that uh, the starting point or this, this step that we made uh, at the beginning of 2014 has uh, helped us to think that actually elimination is possible. So this is a, a long journey. Of course, uh, we had to start by setting up a program, uh, guidelines, uh, training people. At the time, there were not even medicine. Um, it was really like um, trying to dream that something could happen, uh, understanding the burden, the data, and prioritizing those are most at, most at risks. And we started to see uh, BAA is coming. And uh, the first group we actually we started with those people living HIV. Uh, they were not only most uh, affected with double uh, virus, uh, but also there was an opportunity uh, to access some resources, some funding uh, through the usual uh, existing programs uh, into uh, HIV, malaria, and TB program, especially the Global Fund, uh, which we really thank them because they have been a, a step forward. Uh, decentralization has been also a key factor in uh, achieving hepatitis program um, implementation and make it possible. So having this integration with existing program also made uh, an important uh, shift because uh, we couldn't uh, afford to create a new program without even resources. And now, since 2018, we launched uh, elimination of hepatitis C in Rwanda. It was initially a five-year plan uh, to target uh, 4 million people and provide treatment. At the same time, we had already done some previous uh, screening and, and treatment, um, some in, in, in massive campaigns, uh, according to resources available. And as, as of the end of 2018, we were able to, to treat and cure 9,000 people and brought a lot of hope into the communities that hepatitis C is not a death sentence. It's not a disease that uh, will be uh, causing liver cancer and then people 
die. It's actually something that can be treated and killed. So as we screen more people, as even doctors get comfortable to treat hepatitis C, that was a good step forward. Now, from start, we moved into a phase of progress. And progress was already into HCV elimination is possible in Rwanda and beyond. So the price of medication and diagnostics has been a key barrier to, to make this happen. So we started 2019 into negotiation of prices for treatment, but also for RDTs, at the same time as nurses, doctors, intensive care findings continue and centralization up to the community level. Only in 2019, 1.5 million people were screened and 20,000 new people were treated. In 2020, although we had a pandemic that has uh, affected a number of programs, the service decentralization continued and data systems also improved so that we uh, were able to reach 4.3 million people. There are some that are still under screening as we speak and 51,000 community people uh, treated. So we are not far from reaching our targets, but again, we raise again our, our bar as we see more and more needs as we screen more people. The next phase towards um, uh, elimination validation, uh, we'll need to reach uh, 7 million people screened. Uh, there's 2.6 million to uh, data uh, remaining. And this will remain with around 5,000 people to be treated. Uh, we already uh, up 80% um, of people to be treated already reached. And we start to see the elimination of hepatitis C possible uh, in, in Rwanda. And as we start hepatitis B virus, which is also another challenge. How, how this, this, this uh, journey went, also the key drivers of these changes. The main one, as the moderator mentioned, is the pricing access to medications. You'd see that how the change happened from 2014 to 2019, from more than $3,000 US dollars to treat one person with BAAs based treatment, when $1,000 for BAAs when they come. And today we are treating uh, patients and cure up to less than $100, actually 78, 79 US dollar per patient per cure. And diagnostics has gone down up to 0.7. And, and treatment uh, over $60 and SVR at 12 months at nine US dollars. These changes not only helped access to medications, but also changing the picture. How in the beginning uh, access was uh, for those who are most at high risk on the left side of this, this screen, we looked at people who are aged who actually had hepatitis chronically for many years and when community started to see that actually you can test and treat and cure, this is the middle of this slide. You see how people came and the demand was even unexpected. So we had to respond to this. These are millions of people we screened that I mentioned, 4.3. And today the services have been centralized. We don't see massive numbers of people coming to the facility because most of them have been reached. And because it is decentralized at the nearest health center, you can get screened, treated, and receive the viral results and get back to work with a hope to continue without hepatitis C as a burden. Now, this is a snapshot of the results. Uh, you see how uh, in blue, the screening has taken um, up to the red, uh, which are people uh, still waiting for screening. And the blue line, uh, actually in the top on the right side, those are the people who have already been treated. And the remaining ones uh, plan to be reached uh, by end of this year and probably beginning next year. So we can uh, demonstrate that this is something possible. Now, how do we uh, say that termination of hepatitis C is possible? The number of indicators they're working on with different partners uh, to, to assess the screening and treatment, sustainability of services, uh, and also uh, the validation processes, and as well as hepatitis B considerations. 
This is my last slide. Uh, and these are key lessons that I try to, su to, to summarize um, on the key lessons learned, the drivers of hepatitis elimination, as we are not yet there, but I still we hope we get there very, very soon. There are programmatic drivers and non-programmatic drivers. Are the programmatic drivers, I think, thinking that this is possible is key. And career strategy for case finding has been uh, one of the factors we worked on with our partners, simplification of treatment and treatment methods, access, decentralization, and of course, community engagement and services integration, as I said, we didn't bring new staff or new equipments or new structure because we had already HIV uh, system and divisions up to this uh, district level. We use the same mechanism and a lot of resources actually from uh, HIV that helped this other virus to be managed. And non-programmatic drivers, I think you agree with me that uh, leadership drives a lot of changes. And is, this is key across uh, much sectoral engagement. Most of the funding used from uh, private sector. Uh, we have a lot of partners, a lot of champions, including uh, the Excellency First Lady, who is still um, on, with us on this process of elimination and a lot of uh, commitment and uh, ideas to see how we can uh, move even without resources. So these are a few uh, updates and a few experience we can share from Rwanda. I, I thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Zantimana. That is, uh, those are really important lessons, I think, and it's um, extremely um, cheering to see what progress you've made and a, a great example for other countries about what can be done. So thank you indeed. Uh, we're now going to uh, show a short video from uh, Professor Olga Golubovskaya, who is the head of the Department of Infectious Diseases at the National Medical University in Kiev in Ukraine. She unfortunately cannot be with us because she is leading the country's response to COVID-19. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Прежде всего, я хочу поблагодарить организаторов за возможность выступить на таком авторитетном международном форуме в рамках Всемирной Ассамблеи Здравоохранения, посвященном вопросам, вопросам элиминации вирусных гепатитов. Также отдельно я хочу поблагодарить моего друга и историческую личность в этом вопросе Чарльза Гора, потому что наша борьба с этим заболеванием – началась именно с изучения его деятельности и деятельности возглавляемого им Альянса. Отдельно хочу также поблагодарить Всемирную организацию здравоохранения, потому что две резолюции ВОЗ 2010 и 2014 года сыграли решающую, движущую роль в формировании и создании нашей государственной программы профилактики, диагностики и лечения вирусных гепатитов, которая длилась с 2013 по 2016 год и сейчас продолжаются закупки препаратов для этих пациентов. В рамках этой государственной программы мы создали нормативные документы, регламентирующие оказание медицинской помощи больным с гемоконтактными вирусными гепатитами, которые полностью соответствуют международным стандартам. Пациенты стали получать бесплатное лечение. Вначале, конечно, только пигелированными интерферонами. Когда началась эра лечения препаратами прямого действия, мы столкнулись с определенными трудностями, прежде всего связан, связанными с дороговизной этих препаратов. Мы не могли их покупать в рамках государственной программы, иначе это сильно ограничило бы доступ пациентов к лечению. И здесь нам очень помогло сотрудничество с международным патентным пулом, и на сегодняшний день мы имеем доступ к высококачественным, преквалифицированным ВОЗ генерикам, которые, конечно же, во много раз увеличили доступ, наших, доступ к лечению наших пациентов. Пациентов. Конечно, многое мы сделали, однако многие вопросы остаются нерешенными. Прежде всего, это слабые системы эпидемиологического надзора, в результате чего многие э, пациенты просто ускользают от официальной статистики. Как говорит э, Чарльз Гор, в мире много пациентов с гепатитом С, их надо только найти. Также хотелось бы иметь доступ к новым инновационным пангенотипическим и доступным нам методам.
методом лечения гепатита С. И здесь мы также надеемся на сотрудничество с международным патентным пулом. Конечно, коронавирусная инфекция изменила нашу с вами жизнь и жизнь наших пациентов. Наши многие стационары были перепрофилированы под лечение больных с COVID-19. Многие наши врачи разных специальностей, включая хирургические, участвовали в лечении этих пациентов. Я сама нахожусь в эпицентре событий уже больше года, сама переболела, как и многие мои коллеги, и, естественно, мы мало уделяли внимания пациентам с другой патологией. В результате... Наши пациенты с вирусными гепатитами осиротели, и на сегодняшний день мы наблюдаем рост пациентов с декомпенсированным циррозом печени, с запущенными стадиями гепатоцеллюлярной карциномы, только потому, что эти пациенты не имели доступа к лечению. Поэтому ради всех нас, ради нашего будущего мы очень надеемся на дальнейшее международное сотрудничество для того, чтобы мы имели постоянный доступ к высококачественным вакцинам, чтобы мы имели доступ к инновационным препаратам для лечения разных болезней, в том числе и коронавирусной, имели доступ к тем препаратам, которых на сегодняшний день нет на нашем рынке, например, моноклональным антителам. И мы очень надеемся, что мы всегда будем иметь международную поддержку, как это было всегда. Спасибо за внимание, всем здоровья и до новых встреч офлайн. Uh, and now we're going to um, move to the uh, panel discussion, and uh, I have a number of questions for uh, the panelists. Um, and we're going to start with uh, my friend Huma Qureshi from Pakistan. She is the uh, national focal point for hepatitis, and she kindly sent us a video uh, which we're going to play, although she is in fact uh, here to answer your questions online, I think. And so please, I, I did say at the beginning, if you want to ask questions, please put them in the chat. I think it's actually much simpler if you put them in the Q&A function. So if you can use that, that would be great. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Huma Qureshi, and I'm the national focal point for hepatitis for the government of Pakistan. I shall be updating you the hepatitis situation in Pakistan. We have made a great progress in containing hepatitis B. And the current hepatitis B prevalence in children less than five years of age is 0.3% as against 1.3% seen in 2008. So there, there's a great drop in the hepatitis B prevalence in children less than five years of age. For hepatitis C, the current prevalence is 7.5% and that makes Pakistan the world's uh, highest hepatitis C prevalence country uh, globally. With a population of about 200 million people and a viremic rate of 4%, we estimate that we have about 0.8 million people who would require PCRs and then later treatment. We have quite a few challenges. The first and the foremost challenge is that the PCR currently is available only in the tertiary care and uh, not in the primary or the secondary care. And it is expensive, especially for people who want to get it done out of pocket. The second uh, challenge is that we have a paper-based data for hepatitis testing and treatment. And there is no linking or integration between the lab and the hepatitis program. Therefore, it is very difficult to determine the cascade of care and the response to treatment. In 2019, the Prime Minister of Pakistan uh, announced the free testing and treatment for hepatitis C for the whole population and this was to be done through the local funding but then the COVID came and then everything got uh, uh, pushed back and there was priority for COVID so the program could not be launched but despite all this we have quite a few strengths Pakistan is producing the world's cheapest DAAs which are generic and we have a cure rate of almost 95%, in fact, over 95%. And the 12 weeks treatment costs anything between 25 to $30. The COVID response has also led to a huge increase in the capacity to undertake PCR. And now all our data is electronically shared 
with the provinces and even the, with the national level. So we strongly feel that both these strengths will boost the hepatitis C elimination program of Pakistan. The modeling undertaken by Homi Razavi indicates that if we increase the current testing capacity to five times the current capacity and reduce the new infections by eight times the current rate, we shall be able to achieve the SCT elimination by 2030. So we all think that it's doable and we all think that with the great support from the Prime Minister of Pakistan to undertake this HCV elimination project in the near future, Pakistan should be one of those few countries who shall be eliminating the disease in the next few years. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Huma. Um, great to hear what you're um, overseeing in Pakistan. And now it's uh, with great pleasure that I hand over to Dan Juma Adder, who is the uh, president-elect of the World Hepatitis Alliance. Um, so Dan Juma, the World Hepatitis Alliance has an active presence in more than 100 countries and works closely with many ministries of health. You're joining us from Nigeria. So can you explain why it's important for governments to work with patient groups and what governments can do to when uh, they're finding that funding is scarce. Danjuma. All right, thank you, Charles. And thank you for having the World Hepatitis Alliance to be part of this meeting. And it's a great honor and privilege to speak from Nigeria on the experience we have as patient groups and the WHA experience. Now, it's important to remind everyone listening here, looking at the statistics and data from the WHO, that all those data and statistics talks about human beings, talk about mothers, fathers, people, and most especially people that are living in low middle income countries that are grappling with other competing needs in livelihood and socioeconomic survival. And it's very pertinent to note that these are citizens mostly of countries that have very, very poor access to healthcare, especially with respect to viral hepatitis elimination. And these are citizens of countries whose governments have signed up to high political commitments and declarations. For example, we're looking at the global health sector strategy on viral hepatitis elimination 10 years from now. We're looking at even the universal health coverage and also the recent AU declaration. But it's, it's sad to note that majority of the patients, especially in Africa, are left on their, to their fate without, I mean, left at the mercy of the corporate greed from most pharmaceutical companies. So what can governments do differently where there's no funding? Governments can do a lot to take up responsibility. And in fact, it is, I would dare say that it's unacceptable for governments to leave patients at the mercy of the corporate greed of some pharma industries where there are no funded programs. So what can governments do where there's no funding, for example? It is the responsibility and duty of governments having signed up to these political commitments to ensure that they negotiate DAAs for pricing, price reductions on behalf of their citizens. Governments can also help in providing waivers on importation of drugs and insist that these DAAs and medications or commodities and diagnostics, the, the companies, the pharma companies do not take advantage to bring about arbitrary price increase. But the waivers, the, the, the gain they make in these waivers could now be keyed in to reduce prices of commodities and especially drugs for patients. And as I mentioned earlier, majority of the patients that live in most countries, especially from Nigeria, where there's no government from the program, are people living under $2 per day and yet, unfortunately, despite all the global effort towards reducing cost of medications, it costs over $200 for the 12 week regimen for hepatitis C for a patient that is living below $2 a day in a country that Nigeria to access. And where, in most cases, there are no, in fact, where there's no funded program. So the government can also provide health insurance to ensure that patients are insured so that they, 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 they accessing this drug should not drive patients to catastrophic poverty. So that is something governments can do. And also, like in the government, in, in a place like Nigeria, government provides loans to civil, civil servants to order on other needs. That can also be replicated by providing loans to get drugs, to get treatment, to get diagnosis, and to get have access to affordable care. And again, one other area is tier pricing. I'll give an example that in most cases in Nigeria, patient groups have to engage these pharma companies directly in price, in access, in, in, in accessing drugs, which should not be. Patients should not be left to their fate, but government should take up the duty and responsibility of coming in as intermediaries, 
by they can provide tax waivers, they can provide loans to patients to access healthcare. So I will end up by saying that it's pertinent to note that while patients are grappling with other challenging economic situations, patients should not be left on their own to fend for themselves in accessing healthcare. But while governments have signed up to these declarations, they should live up to their responsibility to ensure that patients have access to healthcare in, in the context of equity and equality so that patients do not suffer the catastrophic cost of healthcare. Like it is in Nigeria, there's no funded program, just like we have in most African countries. The example of Rwanda is good for most African countries to replicate. And it's important to work with patient groups because it takes a patient who will adjust the cost of living to be able to, be able to buy these drugs, to be able to buy medications, to be able to afford diagnostics. It takes the voice of the patient to push for advocacy and to drive awareness creation across the region. So thank you so much for having us here. And I hope that as governments sign up to all these declarations and, this, and these goals and strategies are being reviewed, governments will take up the duty and responsibility to ensure that our citizens are not left at the mercy of industry, but governments will stand as intermediaries to ensure that patients have access to medications and diagnosis that will save their lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danjuma, and you are so right. Um, it is really important that governments have national plans that are funded and that they include hepatitis C uh, in their universal health coverage packages. So I'd like to uh, next uh, ask a question of Karen Timmermans, who is the technical manager and uh, on the strategy team at Unitaid. Karen, um, what we know is that, that external funding has been uh, very short, very absent in hepatitis C, but Unitaid was one of the few and one of the first donors to make a significant investment in hepatitis C. So why did Unitaid do this? And what did you do and what have you learned from those investments? Karen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Charles. That's quite a bucket of questions, uh, but I'll <laughs> try to see what I, what I can do in a short time. I think um, the reason we invested, we decided to invest in hepatitis C, which was a little bit outside our mandate, is that we saw new hepatitis C medicines in the pipeline in 2013, 2014, and we realized how revolutionary they were, turning hepatitis from a very difficult um, to treat disease into a disease that could relatively easily be cured. And we also realized that um, it was quite likely that people in low and middle income countries would have to, with hepatitis C, would have to wait quite some time before they would have access to those medicines. And, and we felt um, that that was not right. We wanted to do something about it. Um, and in particular, we realized that the time was short. So we wanted to really accelerate access for people in low and middle income countries. What we did is we started to work with our partners. So that was the MPP, but also MSF, FIND, Coalition Plus, and of course, WHO. To um, we worked to really to work on multiple aspects simultaneously to go as, as fast as possible. So that included working on affordability of, of medicines, but also diagnostics. Um, there was a significant chunk of work um, working on better tests uh, and, and better diagnostic tools. And uh, some examples on this, there was a question in the chat, uh, includes uh, like a range of things from simplifying the algorithm to pre-qualification of tests to assure governments about the quality to the development of accelerating the market entry of tests that are fairly widely used today, um, but also the development of uh, potentially some new tools that are yet to come, but that will help, um, such as, for example, uh, a hepatitis C self-test or a core antigen RDT. We also worked on simplification of, of uh, processes and algorithms. Um, we worked on decentralization. And last but not least, we worked on advocacy and awareness raising because that was also uh, like a fairly large challenge. And I think what we learned um, is, is many things, but probably at the high level, I think the lesson is really that we learned that with the tools that we are having today, um, it is very much feasible uh, to diagnose and to treat hepatitis C in resource limited settings, including but not limited to ART clinics or harm reduction settings. Um, yeah, it's, it's very much feasible to cure people. Um, and um, 
they should do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. Indeed, absolutely. Just do it, as Nike say. Um, so I'd now like to uh, ask a question of uh, Sonia Shilton, who's the Deputy Head for Hepatitis C Access at FIND, the Global Alliance for Diagnostics. So Sonia, with an eye towards return on investment, how can diagnostics be best leveraged for the hepatitis response? Great, yes, thank you for the question. So there still remains this persistent idea that hepatitis C cure is complicated and expensive. And we've just heard about the great advances in making hepatitis C treatment much more affordable in many geographies across the world. So to realize the potential of these new treatments, we need to work with countries to show hepatitis C diagnostics can also be simple and affordable, and that they can enable significant cost savings with great return on investment. So FINE did this, as Karen was just saying, through the Unitaid funded Head Start. We introduced WHO simplified algorithms for the diagnostics of hepatitis C, integrated into existing health systems at the lowest level, such as primary health care or community settings. So this allowed for a lot of gains in efficiency from the simplification of removing genotyping because we don't need that with the pangenotypic DAAs, removing the unnecessary RNA monitoring during treatment, as we all know that the RNA testing can be one of the most expensive parts of the hepatitis C diagnostic algorithm. Through integration, um, we didn't have to set up new programs, but we leveraged on past investments. So past investments that Global Fund has made for harm reduction, as well as past investments that governments have made in primary health care, and hopefully will continue to make in this era of universal health coverage. And, and the underlying significant pillar of this was decentralization. So we've already heard uh, in the Rwandan case of how that decentralization was such an important part and it's bringing care closer to the patient. By expanding access to testing, we are enabling far more people to know their status, which means that those who are positive can get treated early before symptoms and before the disease so color start to manifest. Also, by decentralizing the diagnostics, we are able to catalyze the decentralization of treatment, enabling a one-stop shop um, where the patient and the recipient of care can get all of the care they need without having to move to different locations. Because when you move people, you tend to lose them along the care cascade, and then you're not able to fully engage them in care. So I will quickly show my screen here to show the return on investment. And what you can see is the investment of $8.1 million enabled 100, over 150,000 people to know their status so that over 18,000 people were cured from hepatitis C. And by 2030, this is going to result in over 1,600 lives saved, over 5,000 uh, comorbidities averted, including liver cancer and compensated and decompensated cirrhosis, over 99,000 disability adjusted life years averted, and it's going to save these countries over $47 million in health savings to the, to the health system. This is nearly a six time return on investment, which is a, a, a pretty good deal. <laughs> so, you know, we've shown that we can overcome some of the barriers here, right? The first barrier was that the hepatitis C treatment was, was too expensive. So now that's being solved. The second barrier is that diagnostics are perceived as too expensive and complicated. So we've shown that this can be done. So now our third and maybe final barrier is how can countries embrace this? You know, how can countries take ownership and join the growing number of countries making great strides towards elimination? Danjuma has already highlighted the importance of community and patient groups to overcome this barrier, and we can work together to do it. So we have to do all of this to meet our global targets. Accessible treatment alone is not enough. Thank you. Sonia, thank you very much indeed. And I think that's uh, such an important point. This, you know, really can be cost saving. It's not just cost effective. Um, to tackle hepatitis C, and it's just such a good message for countries. So uh, next, I, I'm going to turn to Sandra Nobre, who is the Head of Business Development uh, here at the Medicines Patent Pool. Uh, so Sandra, how does uh, a license from the Medicines Patent Pool promote access to high quality but affordable DAAs in low and middle income countries? Sandra. Thank you, Charles. Good afternoon, everyone. My pleasure being here with you today representing MPP. 
Uh, Charles, I think uh, the easiest way to answering your question is to explain what does MPP do and what is our model. So I allow myself to share my screen and um, uh, talk to, to our model. Can you see it? Just confirming. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, MPP works to increase access to quality assured medicines through a voluntary licensing mechanism. What does this mean? How does it work? So MPP negotiates public health oriented licenses with patent holders, of course, for the prioritized products. Um, in the hepatitis space, the major ones are the cluster here from the BMS and GP from AbV and others. So, and then what do we do after we license the products? Then we sub-license them to a group of generic uh, manufacturers who will develop, manufacture and distribute affordable generic versions of these products. In the hepatitis space, we work with seven generics. Why seven, can you ask? Why not just only one if he has enough, enough capacity? This is one of the most relevant parts of our model. By working with several manufacturers, we generate competition. This competition leading to a significant price decrease and therefore affordability of these drugs. Just as, as an example, in the case of the Clatus J, since 2016, once this product starts being distributed and sold, this price decrease is around 85% already. So as already mentioned, this is not anymore perhaps the biggest problem we have here. So as a conclusion, the MPP model makes quality generic drugs available at an affordable price. The product being made available and the price bearing being removed, if the other barriers I've just mentioned the longer of this uh, work, workshop, um, if the other barriers can be eliminated as well, access to quality assured hepatitis drug in LMICs can be achieved. Hope, hopefully we get there soon. I stop there, Charles. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Sandra. And now uh, I'm going to ask a question to Craig McCure, who's the Senior Director on Hepatitis at the Clinton Health Access Initiative. Uh, Craig, lovely to see you. How has um, uh, Chai has been working with a, a lot of countries actually on their hepatitis C programs. And from your experience, what are the key drivers of access to hepatitis C treatments at country level? And what do countries need to be thinking about as they start to ramp up their uh, response to hepatitis C? Craig, over to you. Thank you very much, Charles. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for inviting me. Chai has been fortunate over the last uh, six years to have support from the UK's Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office to support a number of countries in Africa and Asia in their efforts to scale up hepatitis C. And the focus of our support has been around global and country level market shaping around prices of cost, uh, commodities, diagnostics and drugs, as well as support to ministries of health around putting in place uh, the, base, the foundations of uh, hepatitis programs. And we have found uh, over the last few years, a number of things which really very clearly put countries in a place where they're positioned for success. And some of those have been mentioned earlier, but I think they're worth uh, mentioning again. First, to have, for a country to have some basic sense of its prevalence of HCV. So even if it's a rudimentary prevalence uh, study, to know your epidemic, uh, we'll know that all older people in all countries who receive blood transfusions before screening in the 90s or invasive procedures like dialysis, are at risk and often symptomatic. Countries that have or have had significant unsafe needle use in the health sector are likely to have high rates of HCV across ages and populations. And of course, countries where there's significant injecting drug use will have very high rates of HCV among people who inject drugs. So understanding your epidemic is important. Secondly, for ministries of health to establish the foundation of a national hepatitis program, even if it's beginning small with a technical working group to develop guidelines, train staff, put in place M&E systems, develop an investment case, and most importantly, to have a budget line and a budget, even if it's very small, this will be an important signal that countries have used to be, to be able to access catalytic support. 
Third, of course, is to adopt the use of WHO's recommended simplified public health approach, the rapid screening of patients followed by a viral load to confirm chronic infection, followed by pangenotypic DAAs for cure, followed 12 weeks after completing treatment with a final viral load to confirm cure. And putting in place a simplified approach enables programs to integrate and decentralize quickly. And often integration, one of the places where countries have been successful at integration is using their HIV programs. The reason I mention that is because once these factors are in place and political will is demonstrated publicly, it's really quite easy for countries to access some catalytic funding to support their programs. And one area of significant, uh, small but important catalytic funding has been through the Global Fund for countries that apply to for diagnosis and treatment of hep c among their hiv positive population so their co-infected population rwanda is a great example that we heard from today we've supported rwanda another com uh, a no number of other countries we've supported have started this way with uh catalytic funding from the global fund for co-infection and increasingly we're starting to see countries apply to the global fund for more of a comprehensive harm reduction package for people who inject drugs, including diagnosis and treatment of hepatitis C. And finally, I just wanna mention two points, that once countries have these factors in place, it's much easier for them to negotiate cheaper prices along the lines of what Rwanda has uh, achieved, an 80% overall commodity cure package, 75 cents for an RDT, nine dollars for viral load sixty dollars for the drugs themselves you know a package less than eighty dollars that most low and low middle income countries should be able to achieve if demonstrated political will and taken the steps i identified before to put a program in place that shows that they're serious about elimination of hepatitis c and finally it's been mentioned before but it's very important countries do need to include in the long term uh, hepatitis C uh, within their universal health coverage packages. It's very clear the cost savings incurred through hepatitis elimination, through reductions in liver cancer and liver disease that put an enormous burden on countries. So those are some of the things we've learned, Charles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Craig. And I just want to say to uh, all the panelists uh, and speakers, this is the first uh, meet a Zoom meeting I've attended during COVID where everybody has stuck to time. You are absolutely brilliant. You are the best panel ever. Thank you. Um, so we've actually got uh, just a few minutes, uh, a couple of minutes, and I want to pick up. There have been a lot of questions, and thank you so much, panelists, for answering the questions online. But there was one I just thought I'd ask. Um, it was around how do you get political will? Because we know this is an essential part of the response. And actually I thought, um, Huma, since you haven't had a, a chance to actually uh, speak live, do you know how uh, it happened that the prime minister got behind hepatitis elimination? What convinced him that this was a good thing to push for? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Charles, and uh, thank you for all, all the members of the group uh, who's there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, actually, uh, the, the moving force for the prime minister to take up this issue uh, was our minister, uh, who was uh, from, who was a, do a doctor and a public health expert. And, you, you know, when you have a minister who is a doctor who, and who understands the issue, then it becomes easy for the minister to convince the prime minister. So it was a you know step up approach where the uh, minister uh, convinced the prime minister that this is one of the major issues uh, that we need to address. And the uh, and uh, it's a low hanging fruit because you treat them for twelve weeks and you get uh, cure the people. So the, so that was it, uh, Charles actually. Okay, thank you. So I think the message is you need a champion. Uh, who can push it to the top of the political uh, political level? Level, Dr. Santimana. I mean, uh, could I ask you uh, what it was that that convinced the government to really get behind this in uh, in Rwanda? 
Was it again the fact that you could bring the prices down? Well, um, th th thank you. I mean, it, it's it's a number of factors uh, for sure, uh, and the first one is um, uh, to to have data, at least some information to to start with. So, if you have people dying from a certain disease, and you can tell that we can't allow this to continue to happen, um, has has helped even with a few data that uh, we collected in two hospitals in 2014. Uh, we were able to tell that this disease is taking uh, lives of people. Some people even we know, very important doctors, parents, uh, family members. So that helped. Uh, and to achieve that, we started with um, uh, key people who have uh, some roles to play in the community, like champions, as you say, but also uh, some key leaders in other sectors, um, uh, doctors were able to speak to their uh, peers. So, I mean, it, it's it's a multi-strategic ways of engaging uh, people who may make a difference. But of course, having partners in country uh, supporting and going together as as, as a team, a technical working group, the steering committee. Those are the kind of uh, starting points that we only need to be kept because it's not one time. We need to continue to have people all around. Uh, to make this voice heard and even maintain and bringing some resources uh, around it. Thank you so much. Yes, that's a very important message, I think, about maintaining it. Um, it it's not enough to do it for, you know, one year. Um, okay, so um, Meg, I'd like to hand over to you, if I might, for some concluding remarks. Okay, thank you very much, um, Charles. This was a fantastic panel, as you said, and it was such an active um, Q&A and chat. And certainly as soon as a question came up, it was so nice to see that the panelists uh, worked very quickly to answer the questions. So I also have been um, so impressed with the advocacy and leadership of those of you working in hepatitis. It is a focused and very tight-knit group that is really moving towards impact. And, and I think that uh, I always believe that hepatitis C has the greatest chance of really having a global cure and elimination in our lifetime up before for the SDGs. So we want, at WHO want to help that uh, move forward. I also have heard from the chat that it's important to keep hepatitis B on the agenda that hepatitis B and C some at times and in certain populations travel together. But if a country has a very strong hepatitis C program and they have not yet started on their hepatitis B program, we also want to encourage them to do that. And that starts especially for the African region with the hepatitis B birth dose because it's not regularly available in all countries. And lastly, we also heard that there are many out countries out there who are not being called to the table to share their results. And we know that Kenya would like to share their results. So the next time we have a conversation, we'll ask Kenya to give us an indication of how they've managed their program. <clears throat> Last to say, we'll be discussing uh, the global health sector strategies tomorrow at the World Health Assembly. And we are um, then starting right at that point when we hopefully we have a decision that we can move forward with sharing surveys and starting on regional and country consultations to be able to bring forward a very strong global health sector strategies on viral hepatitis. And we need all of your inputs for that. So with this, I, I say thank you for having WHO and I thank all my colleagues at WHO who helped put those slides in the report together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meg. So thank you all uh, our speakers and panelists uh, for taking part in this and for the MPP team who uh, put this together, particularly the communications team. So as I said, this is one of uh, three uh, lunchtime events, uh, lunchtime if you're in the Central European zone, uh, during the World Health Assembly. The second one is tomorrow. Uh, the World Hepatitis Fund is hosting uh, an event looking at hepatitis funding. And on Friday, Coalition Plus will be looking at uh, an event more around community-based organizations and their important role, which we've heard about today. So thank you so much uh, taking part in this, in this um, 
short but I think very illuminating uh, discussion on how we can achieve elimination and we at the Medicines Patent Pool very much look forward in uh, supporting everyone's efforts in this through um, access to affordable medicines. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye.